Good morning. Welcome back. We are now at John chapter 12. And um, in this chapter, we'll be looking at Christ and the crisis. But in specifics, there are three incidents that brought Jesus' uh, ministry, public ministry, to an end. Um, thereafter, he focused on his own apostles, his disciples. So the three events were the anointing at Bethany. Uh, and then we, we see the, the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus into Jerusalem and the coming of the Greeks. And all these three incidents brought Jesus' ministry to an end, public ministry. And if you look at the screen, the chapter is divided into this where he ministered to four groups of people and we have Jesus and his friends, verse 1 to 11. Jesus and the Passover pilgrims, verse 12 to 19. Jesus and the Gentile visitors, verse 20 to 36. Jesus and the unbelieving Jews. Um, before we begin, I, I want to take you back to the last uh, eight days uh, in the life of our Lord Jesus. And before we do, Father, we just want to thank you once again for your word preserved for us. Lord, we ask that uh, you speak to our minds, speak to our hearts this morning, even to these faithful students who uh, listen to you week in and week out. Lord, we ask that you enlighten us with your truth for our edification and application. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, before we begin chapter 12, I just want to highlight some statistics. In total, uh, there are 89 chapters in the four books of the Gospel. And the first 30 years of our Lord Jesus' life on earth they were captured in four chapters. So his last three years were captured in the remaining 85 chapters of the four books. And then you go even deeper. The last eight days of our Lord Jesus' life on earth, they were captured in 27 chapters. This is about one third of the gospel, one third of the 89 chapters. So one third of the gospel focus on our Lord's death and his resurrection. And so even as we begin John chapter 12, and this is his final week on earth. And this is chapter 12. This book has got 21 chapters. And you see it's almost half the book that is focused on his last week on earth. So let's begin with uh, Jesus and his uh, disciples, Jesus and his friends. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, these are the friends of our Lord Jesus. And even in the last, these are dear friends of his, and even in the last week of his life, in spite of the opposition, that he knew he would face when he approaches Jerusalem, when he goes to Judea and he approaches Jerusalem. Still, he spent some time with his dear friends. And this time, it was at the home of an ex-leper by the name of Simon. So we look at verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, so this is like it is a Saturday, uh, Jesus came uh, to Bethany, uh, which is, if you remember, which was 
from the map we had last week and previous weeks, uh, which is only a short distance, perhaps about two miles southeast of uh, Jerusalem. So Jesus came to Bethany, uh, where Lazarus was, who had been dead. And last week we spent uh, the lesson on the raising of uh, Lazarus to life, who was dead for four days. So, now we want to see whose house this is because it is not mentioned here. But if we look at the, if we look at the same event recorded by uh, Matthew in Matthew chapter twenty-six verse six, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, the ex-leper rather, a woman came to him with an having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table so here it is recorded by matthew that the uh, the perfume or the fragrant oil was poured on the head of our lord jesus but we just read in uh, john chapter 12 that mary poured this and wiped his feet with her hair so um, apparently Mary uh, not only wiped his head but also wiped his feet if you read the, the books in totality. So we read again verse uh, verse 2. There they made him a supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table. I want to point you to this. Martha served. And as you read this passage, she was not complaining as before as in the past when she went up to jesus and said look my sister is not helping me you know i'm the only one left alone to to to, to attend to the cooking in the kitchen <coughs> and this time this time martha was serving 17 people and she wasn't complaining and who are the 17 so there are 12 disciples plus Jesus, 13, then plus the three beloved disciples. So you have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Simon, the ex leper, who is the host. So in total, 17. But now, now, Martha has been transformed and she is not complaining anymore because she has seen, even in chapter 11 of John, that Jesus is indeed God, the Savior, the one who raised her brother to life. And she is not complaining anymore. So Mary here is the worker. So we will be seeing the role that three these three disciples did, beloved disciples of Jesus. And so Mary served as a faithful worker now. And in all that we do for Christ, I want to say, it will not be forgotten. So if you look at Hebrews chapter uh, 6 verse 10, you will find, For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So what you have done in the past and you are still doing, your labor of love for God is not forgotten. God takes notice and it's recorded here. Even in the uh, gospel, Martha served and we should do likewise. We should do so practically. Martha served practically. And what about Lazarus? He just sat there. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Wonderful. Lazarus, who once was dead but now alive, and he was sitting at the table with our Lord Jesus. So were we. Once we were dead in our sins, but now we are alive in Christ and we are seated at the table of communion with Christ. Amen. So, but Lazarus was one of those who sat. So, what was he doing? Nothing. He was just sitting there, fellowshipping with our Lord Jesus. I will say more about him as we uh, go to verse 10. 
Then we go on. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spinach, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And what was Mary doing? Mary was the worker. No, I mean, sorry, Mary was the worshipper. She was worshipping Christ. And the, the, the few occasions, I think three, that was recorded or recorded of Mary, she was always at the feet of our Lord Jesus. And she, having heard the, the, the word from him, she realized, she, she understood what Jesus was saying, that he was pointing everyone to his death. To his sacrifice and she knew that this was the best time now that Jesus is in her home this is the best time for her to, to express her love her worship her, her gratefulness unto this this son of man son of God Jesus Christ who raised his bro her brother to life and she did so uh, sacrificially and, and she took a pound of very costly oil or spina. Now this this oil came from North India and it's known to be very costly as we shall read later. It is worth about one year's of wages. And she did so sacrificially. Now and she she she, she did not want to worship God with things that did not cost her much. She 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 was like David. You know, King David wanted that piece of land. And then this uh, Onan said, no, you can have it. Right? But Onan said to David, take it to yourself and let my Lord, the King, do what is good in his eyes. This is in First Chronicles chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 23, First Chronicles 21, 23. Take it to yourself and let my Lord, the King, do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Then King David said to Onan, No, I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. David would not offer unto the Lord that which cost him nothing. Mary would not worship Jesus with that which cost her nothing. So she gave her very best. She gave her very best unto the Lord. And she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. As we mentioned previously, it was very unbecoming of a woman to, to let down her hair in public. They are meant to be bundled up somewhere, you know, at the back, on top, wherever, but not to be let down. But she did. She let her hair down and she used it to wipe his feet with her hair. And that was her worship unto the Lord. And what was she doing, in fact? Her worship, her act, was a selfless act. She was selfless. She wasn't focused on herself, but unto our Lord Jesus. It was a sacrificial act because, as I said, it cost her a lot of money. It was grateful. It was a grateful act because her brother was dead, but now alive. And it was a humble act. What she did was the work of a slave or a servant, but she did so on her own. That was her devotion to our Lord Jesus. It was a personal act of love unto the Lord. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And the house was filled with the fragrance. I mean, if you, I mean, perfume is meant to give a good odor, or aroma, smell. And now the whole alabaster jar is broken and, and, and and poured upon him surely the whole house is filled and you know something she also smelled like jesus because she was nearest to jesus she, and she would smell just like jesus and not only her but everyone else in the room and the whole room was filled with the fragrance of the oil 
So spread your love around. Everyone will be blessed. And more than that, Jesus, Jesus uh, 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 commanded her and said, even in verse 13, Matthew chapter 26, verse 13, what did Jesus say to her? What did Jesus command her? Uh, surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Until today, we are still talking about her labor of love, about her worship unto our Lord Jesus. We are still blessed by what she has done. So go forth and worship our Lord Jesus. And, and, and fill the, the, the room, fill the place wherever you are with your worship. And you will not know how many people will be blessed. The whole room's atmosphere will be changed. And that is what Mary had done. So we go back to John chapter 12. We are looking at uh, verse 4. But one of his disciples, Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This guy, Judas Iscariot, you know, as we read in John chapter 6, verse 64, Jesus already knew that one of his disciples would betray him. One of them is a is a traitor. And here in, 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 in John chapter 12, verse 4, he spoke. And you notice not only Judas Iscariot was mentioned, but also his father's name, Simon's son. And so it is a responsibility of the father uh, to raise the, the his son, his children, in a proper and disciplined uh, and God-fearing manner because it will show, it will reflect on the father how he had raised his child. Apparently, Simon, this Simon did not raise Judas very well. And so his name is here. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? expensive one year's wages and given to the poor you know what judas had he had a good mouth but a bad heart and that was the true nature of him the true nature of an unbeliever and the unbeliever would uh, oppose the things of god the unbeliever doesn't understand worship the unbeliever uh would, would see it uh, from a different perspective, is more for self than be selfless. And here, what we saw in verse 5 was the first recorded words of the traitor Judas. And what were they? Why was this fragrant all not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Was he really that compassionate? No, as we shall see, he is a thief. And if you read even in Mark chapter uh, uh, 14, verse 4, you will find that the other disciples were actually influenced by him. So same event, but this time is recorded by uh, Mark. And Mark said, there, but there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. These disciples were influenced by Judas. And likewise, they also criticized uh, uh, Mary for wasting the fragrant on okay so be careful you just need one bad apple and you'll spoil the whole basket so back to john chapter 12 so now we look at verse 
6. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, he was a treasurer, Judas, and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. He was a thief, you know. And probably he wanted the money. If this can be so, he wanted the money to be kept in a money box since she was giving it away to Jesus. But why not give it instead of in liquid form, but in solid form, in money? Put it in a money box, then he can have his uh, access to this money. That was Judas Iscariot. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. What Jesus was saying was simply this. You guys do not understand what Mary is doing. She is the only one who has understood all that I've taught you, all that I've spoken. I've, I've been pointing you guys to my death and my burial and resurrection. Now, and Mary knew, having sat at Jesus' feet always, often, she knew that this was her best chance to anoint Jesus. Because in those days, if you were crucified as a criminal, more often than not, they will throw the dead body after the crucifixion, throw the dead body over the cliff outside the city. And that's how executed criminals were treated. And she will never, never have that chance to anoint Jesus, Jesus' body. So this was her best chance. So Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. And for the poor, you have always, yes, God, since the Old Testament, since the Pentateuch, God has a, a, a compassion for the sick, no, no, for the poor, the old, the young, those, those who are strangers in the land. God has a compassion for them, the poor. But Jesus was saying, physically, these poor people, with you, 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 can have, you have them always, but I have only a limit time, limited time left. But me, you do not have always. So let her be. So if you do anything for Christ, do not worry. Christ will defend you. Verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. Jesus was there. He wasn't in Jerusalem yet. He was outside. He was in Bethany. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So these people who came, these Jews, they had a belief, but their belief was out of curiosity. I mean, it isn't every day you get to see a dead man raised to life. And that's what Lazarus was. He was dead, but now he is alive. So they came not just to see Jesus, but also to see Lazarus. And you know, if, if there was a tour to Israel those days, then they probably uh, would include this in the itinerary. Photo taking with Lazarus. So everyone will go to Bethany just to have a photo session with the one who once was dead, but now alive. And that's what they were doing. And have we heard anything from Lazarus yet? Nothing. Nothing. He was just seated there at the table. That they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Why? Why did the chief priest, all these religious leaders, wanted to kill Lazarus, you know, uh, again, make him die again? Because on account of him, 
many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So they came with curiosity. They want to see this Lazarus who was dead but now alive. So what in effect was Lazarus doing? How was he serving Christ? Mary served as a worshipper. Martha served as a worker. Mary did so spiritually. Martha did so practically. But what was Lazarus doing? He was a witness. He served Jesus as a witness and he did so individually. Now, witnessing for Christ is not what you do, but who you are. People see you, people watch you, who you are. And they saw Lazarus. And many, on account of him, on account of Lazarus, many, many of these Jews, they went away and believed in Jesus. So, walk in faith. Walk the talk. Even as you talk the walk. And you will draw many to Jesus Christ. But verse 10 also has this. But the chief priests, but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. They refused to accept the evidence they, 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 the evidence of life from dead they want to destroy the evidence they, they didn't want to change their mind they were so fixated that it cannot be and if this persists then their position their authority their influence would be shaken because there is someone else more powerful the people's attention will be directed there and not to the religious leaders so they didn't want to change their mind so they want to destroy the evidence but let me tell you Lazarus cannot be afraid he wouldn't be afraid because he was dead once what else can you frighten him with death again I don't think he was afraid so he just sat there and witnessed for our Lord Jesus Christ and many believe in Jesus Christ so you can serve him as a worker as a worshipper or as a witness but my advice to you my suggestion to you have a balance have a balanced ministry serve God serve Jesus as a worshipper and as a worker and as a witness Balance it with these three W's and you will do well. So now we come to the second part of this chapter, which is uh, Jesus' triumphal entry. And this is Jesus and the Passover pilgrims. We had just studied Jesus and his friends. Now Jesus and the Passover pilgrims. Verse 12. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, this is famously known as the triumphal entry. But if we look at this text and understand the context, it is more like a tearful entry. Not, not exactly the triumphal entry. That will happen when Jesus comes again at his second coming. When he will come victoriously. You read all this in Revelation chapter 19 and he will put down the enemies of God, the, you know, the the. the the, the beast, you know, Satan and all this. But now, he came in fulfillment of the prophecy, even riding on the donkey. And as we look at verse 12, the next day, a great multitude. Now, how, how great is this? Now, Josephus, the historian, said that at each and every Passover festival, about 250,000 sheep were slaughtered. Now, if you do the simple calculation, 
as as uh, you know the basis of which from from the pentateuch every household of 10 they sacrifice they, they slaughter one sheep so if it is so every household one sheep and if you have 250000 sheep slaughtered for the passover then simply put there would have been 2.5 million people in Jerusalem for that festival and so that's why in verse 12 the next day a great multitude that had come to the feast the Passover when they heard that Jesus by then Jesus was well known he was famous they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem they took branches of palm trees now palm trees they, 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 they are a national symbol for Israel, the palm leaves. They, they are a national symbol for Israel. And it, is, it symbolizes victory. You know, it's a picture of victory. Now, if we look back, if we look back to uh, Leviticus chapter 23, look at Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23. And let's see. Leviticus 23 verse uh, I think it is 40 and you shall take and, and in Levit Leviticus 23 is this chapter where uh, in this section here it, I mean Leviticus 23 is the, the record the instructions for the seven feasts to be held in Jerusalem each year and in verse 40 in verse 40 this is in the section on the Feast of Tabernacles. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, the branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Now, the Feast of the Tabernacles, each feast points to Jesus. And for the Feast of Tabernacles, it points to, I mean, first of all, it reminds them of God's faithfulness when the people of Israel were in the wilderness after they left Egypt and how God had been faithful to them, providing for them shelter and food and everything, water, even in the wilderness. So they, they are so grateful and thankful to him. So every year they will celebrate this Feast of Tabernacles. They would even construct all these temporary uh, uh, shelters. It is as if to relieve the moments that their forefathers had in the wilderness. But that was looking back. But it, Feast of Tabernacle is also for them to look forward to the kingdom that God had promised when the Messiah shall come and, 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 and establish his kingdom here on earth. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. That, that's looking forward even at the Feast of Tabernacles. And to bring, and when that happens, it is going to be victorious. God's words in fulfillment and the kingdom of God is on earth. And so they brought forth amongst the other, amongst the other uh, trees, they brought forth branches of palm trees. So, we look at another one, Zechariah uh, uh, 14, verse 16. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem by, by this uh, Zechariah was saying after the, the tribulation, after Jesus had uh, uh, put down all the enemies of God, this is at the end, after the, the tribulation, and at Jesus' second coming. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. This is... Uh, after the tribulation, this is into the millennium. The Lord of hosts and to keep what? To keep the Feast of Tabernacles. To keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of Tabernacles is a time of, uh, of, of uh, 
victory of of uh, the fulfillment of God's promise that He will establish His kingdom here on earth with the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, uh, leading them and sitting on the throne, the throne of David forever and ever. So that is the fulfillment. So the what I'm saying to you is they brought forth even at the Feast of Tabernacles, as we read earlier in Le Leviticus 23, all these palm leaves or leaves of the palm trees. And so with that in mind, you will now understand uh, why these people brought forth, even in verse 13, they took out branches of palm trees and went out to meet Jesus. They knew Jesus was in town. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And they took branches. Verse 13, they took branches. They came with the expectation of victory. That indeed Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is coming and he is the Messiah. And they went out to meet him. And they meet him not with any other uh, 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 branch. But with the branch or the branches of palm tree. Because this is victorious. The fulfillment of God's promise to the people of Israel that he will establish his kingdom here on earth. And they went out to meet him and they cried out, Hosanna. Means what? Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And this was quoted from Psalms 118 verse 25 and verse 26. You look into your center margin, it is there. Psalm 118 verse 25, 26. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. You know, what was in what is important is what was in the mind of these people even as they proclaimed this. They quoted this. Yes, they are looking at the Messiah, but they thought Jesus is the political Messiah, that they, he is here now to deliver them from the Roman rulers. They thought it is now, it is national deliverance. They were not thinking of spiritual deliverance. They were thinking of national political deliverance. Here is the political Messiah. And they were wrong. They were wrong. So, if you read the corresponding verse in, in Luke chapter 19, in Luke chapter 19, at this stage, Jesus wept. So you look, Luke 19 verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. What was Jesus saying? He was pointing them that it is not over. AD 70 is coming when the Romans will come and put down this Jerusalem and the temple and the walls and so on. So Jesus wept. So it is a tearful entry, not a triumphal entry. Okay, so we go back to John chapter 12 and in verse 14. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey sat on it as it is written fear not daughter of zion behold your king is coming sitting on a donkey's coat and you know how wonderful how amazing this is the fulfillment of zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 so earlier he fulfilled psalm 118 25 26 now is zechariah 9 verse 9 and this was written hundreds of years ago. And now indeed he came as it was written that he came on a donkey. And here, uh, of course, if you read Matthew and, and the other books, you, you get more details. But we all know from what we have learned previously that this young donkey was an untamed donkey. It was while no one has sat on it. And it is not easy it is not easy to handle 
any young untamed donkey the the donkey will resist but jesus got on the young donkey and rode into jerusalem what is the lesson here jesus can handle any stubborn donkey like you and i he surely can okay it's not easy but the other important thing we need to learn it's a donkey a donkey is an animal of peace in in in, in war time the, the the generals the warriors will ride on horses even as we see in in revelation chapter 19 when jesus shall come again at the second coming when he comes again to to fight the enemies he was on a horse but that is the horse is an animal of war but but the donkey is a picture of peace and here it is also about humility and so even as jesus rode on the donkey into jerusalem what we are looking is the king who was humble and peaceful he came in humility and he came in peace that's what it symbolizes jesus when he had found a young donkey sat on it as it is written fear not O uh, fear not daughter of zion daughter of zion if you go and read Z jeremiah jeremiah chapter 4 verse 31 and there are a few other verses it will tell you very clearly the daughter of zion is jerusalem fear not jerusalem fear not daughter of zion behold your king is coming and how he is sitting on a donkey's coat verse 16 his disciples did not understand these things at first but when jesus was glorified then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him it's i mean sometimes we, we mock this uh, disciples you know you you follow jesus uh, for three years you, you you heard what he said you 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 saw what he did and how come you don't understand you wish you were there in their place instead of this uh, this uh, uh, people these 12 disciples but you know many a times we read the scriptures and we don't understand but we keep at it we listen we read we 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 we, we study a bit more then we after a period of time we learn from others and so, then then we begin to understand so some things take time so you look at verse 16 you understand that for the disciples his disciples did not understand these things at first but when jesus was glorified that means jesus died resurrected and ascended back to the father and who came the holy spirit came and when the holy spirit came the holy spirit brought to remembrance all the things that jesus had taught them then they remembered that these things were written about him about jesus and they had done these things to him so the lesson here is keep reading the word keep studying the word it will come to you eventually verse 17 therefore the people who were with him when he called lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness for this reason the people also met him because they had heard that he had done this sign the pharisees therefore said amongst themselves you see that you are accomplishing nothing look the world has gone after him so verse 17 therefore the people who are these people these are the local people but they in the community they they they, they were there when they saw lazarus raised from the dead so they were witness they saw for this reason uh the people also met him again as we mentioned earlier in verse uh, 9 these people came out of curiosity because they, they they saw the sign and they probably wanted to see more but the people who were upset 
the religious leaders. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. You know what they were doing? They were, they were blaming each other. You see, you, you all are ineffective. I, 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 I thought you, you all were supposed to go and trap him, tempt him, whatever, and then uh, 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 bring him in, and then we can e eliminate him. Now, you, you are not even stopping his ministry. He has it, uh, impacted and influenced so many others, even these people who saw the... The, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So they exaggerated and they said, Look, the world has gone after him. Really? It was only Bethany, Jerusalem, and perhaps Galilee and so on. But these Pharisees, as usual, they love in their jealousy and anxiety, they, they just exaggerated. Look, the world has gone after him. It was an overstatement, but you know, it was also a prophecy. Indeed, it shall be after Christ has ascended back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes. And you will see from the book of Acts onwards, the gospel went out to the rest of the world. Okay? But one thing we need to learn before we move on is that what Jesus was doing was against the plan of the Pharisees. He was forcing the hands of the Pharisees. If you remember, the Pharisees wanted to arrest Jesus and do whatever they had plotted to do to kill him. But after the Passover, because during the Passover, there are too many people. They wanted to do so after the Passover. But this was not God's plan. Jesus, being the Passover lamb, must be sacrificed during the Passover. Jesus, being the Passover lamb, must be sacrificed during the Passover. And so Jesus forced the hands of the Pharisees. Act now. In fulfillment of the prophecy, according to God's timetable. So he came in on the donkey and, and people get excited and the crowd surround. So if there is anything the Pharisees must do, they better shift shift their, their, their timetable. They, they have to act faster, earlier. Okay? So that is uh, Jesus and the Passover programs. Now we look at uh, Jesus and the Gentiles. Jesus and the Gentile visitors. Verse 20 to 36. So you look at verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Wonderful. And these were not Jews. Some said they were Greek speaking Jews. No, these were Gentiles. These were foreigners, but they were God fearing. They were not proselytes. That means they have not converted to Judaism yet. These are Jews who, no, these are Gentiles uh, who are God fearing. They are, they are Greeks and, and they are God fearing. And they came to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah, came to the temple to worship, but of course they cannot go further than the court of the Gentiles, but they came to worship Jehovah. And they must have heard of Jesus, and so they want to approach Jesus. So they try to find a, 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 an intermediary, find, try to find a link man. And they approach Philip. Why? Because Philip is a Greek name. Now, Philip wasn't a Jew, but he had a Greek name. Sometimes it is probably for convenience as he moved around in those days, the lingua franca, that means the common language, is Greek. So perhaps that name helps. And, and you ask, why so? Well, you are Chinese, right? We are Chinese, right? But some of us Chinese got Christian name. Well, how come you got Christian name? For whatever reason right it's not your fault your parents name you or sometimes you choose yourself but it is for a reason for convenience whatever you know 
Uh, so you have a Christian name. So Philip had a Greek name, even though he was a Jew. And so we read again, verse 20, now there were certain Greeks, so not all Greeks are God-fearing, these are certain Greeks, amongst those who came. So amongst those who came to worship at the feast. So there, are, there were other Gentiles who came to worship at the feast. Okay? Amongst those who came, even Jews, of course, Jews and Gentiles who came to worship at the feast of the Passover. And then they came to Philip because him having a Greek name, they thought, wow, there is some common ground we can share. So approach him, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And this is something that you need to underline. We wish to see Jesus. Not that we wish to see his signs and his wonders and this and that, but we wish to see Jesus only and only Jesus. And if only we can apply that to ourselves, instead of chasing around you know, to prophecies and signs and wonders, well, nothing wrong with those. But the key reason in approaching him is to want to see him, see Jesus. We look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Matthew 12, verse 38. And what do we have? In comparison, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees, these religious leaders, answered saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Huh? I thought Jesus just did, did some miracles before. And they said they wanted to see a sign from Jesus. So here you have Jews who wanted to see signs and signs. They just don't have enough. And here came along these Greeks, these Gentiles, and they said, we want to see Jesus. So my prayer to you is, my prayer for you, not to you. My prayer for you is see Jesus, Jesus only and only Jesus. Seeing him and knowing him, that is key. Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Why tell Andrew? Because Andrew is the people connector. He, he stays in the background. He, his brother he takes the limelight. His brother Peter loves to talk and utter his words and, and so on. But Andrew, in his own quiet way, he was also effective in his ministry. He was bringing people to Christ. He brought the boy with the, the two loaves and five fish. He brought to Jesus. You know, Andrew has a good ministry. A fruitful ministry and he brought together with Philip brought these Greeks to Jesus verse 23 but Jesus answered saying the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified the hour has come you know this is quite in contrast with what Jesus had been saying all along so let me point you to this because then you realize Jesus was on God's schedule. It wasn't haphazard. So in John chapter 2 verse 4, this was at the wedding of Cana. And when his mother came to him and said, uh, they have no more wine. She, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Next, we look at John 7, verse 30. John 7, verse 30. Where is it? There are just too many on the screen. John 7. Ah, I must want to do it here. John 7. Verse 30. 
Therefore, they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. His enemies wanted to put him down, arrest him, but his hour had not yet come. Uh, 8 verse 20 Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Going. Oh, I'm reading wrong. I'm reading. I'm supposed to read. Verse 20. Okay, John 8, verse 20. This was Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. But now, in John chapter 12, in verse 23, Jesus said, My hour has come. The hour of his death, the hour of crisis, the hour has come that the Son of Man be glorified. How? By being crucified at the cross. But you know, in the Romans' world of uh, judgment, of justice, of punishment. The cross, by being hung on the cross, it is a curse. It is a curse. You can read this even in uh, Galatians uh, chapter 3 verse 13. Turn on your own. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. It is shameful. It is a disgrace. But here Jesus is saying the Son of Man and He knew what kind of death He would be going through. And he said that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verse 24. A tractor just passed by outside my window. Okay, Do not be distracted. Verse 24. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone but if it dies it produces much grain so what Jesus was actually pointing that he I mean he's the greatest teacher he, he teaches using parables and pictures illustrations metaphors and even by this you know was Jesus pointing them to he was pointing them to his death his burial and his resurrection because when a seed falls it is death right into the ground that means into the ground to be buried by the soul that is burial but one of these days out from the ground will shoot forth a new tree a new plant you know new life and that is resurrection so it is so beautiful just in this verse verse 24 most assuredly i say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground so wheat falls death into the ground burial and dies it remains alone but if it dies i mean it remains alone it doesn't multiply it doesn't grow anything but if it dies, it produces much grain. That is, it will come forth more. It will multiply out of the ground. So that is resurrection. So Jesus, his death would produce fruit to the glory of God. Verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life now imagine uh, these are the greeks coming he said we want to see jesus sir okay okay andrew said okay come i bring you to jesus and jesus wasn't exactly addressing the greeks or teaching them or hosting them but since the greeks were around he taught and this was meant not only for the Jews, for the disciples, the Jewish disciples, but also meant for the Greeks. That means for us as well. And now he went on in verse 25. He who loves his life, meaning he who loves 
his life more than God means he prioritized his things in life on a higher level than God God is not number one in his life he will lose it he will lose what he will lose eternal life and he who hates his life in this world that means he who values his life less important than serving Christ serving God so Christ and God take first place in his life everything else comes after and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life the earlier person will lose eternal life but he will keep it for eternal life and then Jesus went on to make two promises in verse 26 if anyone serves me if anyone serves me so anyone who is anyone Jews and Gentiles including you and I if anyone serves me let him follow me that is obedience and the word there is continuous let him continue to follow me if anyone serves me let him follow me and first promise where I am there my servant will be also and where I am there my servant will be also you know what is the lesson here means we being where the Lord is not the other way around means where the Lord is there I will be also that means I will be where Jesus is I will be where his will is for me that means I will do I will go according to his will not the other way around that where I am Jesus will be but Jesus said where I am and how do you know where to go what to do if you are directed by the Word of God you will be according to his will so if you are directed by the Word of God where I am you are as you are directed by the Word of God there there uh, my servant will be also so where Jesus is you will be there because you have been directed by the Word of God secondly second promise if anyone serves me so first one is obey second one is serve if anyone serves me what is the second promise him my father will honor my father will reward so there will first if you serve him you 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 follow him uh, where Jesus is you will be there secondly if you serve him God the Father will reward you even as I pointed you to Hebrews 6 verse 6 God is not unjust to forget your labor of love so this this was the teaching of Jesus even to these Greeks but it's not over there, there are still more to come uh, we will take a pause here and when we return, we finish the rest of this chapter.